with Jennifer Sullivan and this is our next edition of On the Table with the Green Party and we'll be talking about what is sustainable economics and uh, we have three honored guests with us today and first of all we're, we're, I'll introduce them as soon as we hear from Jared Austin who is a USF student and a Green Party member and he's going to be reading about the Green Party's economic justice and sustainability platform just excerpts from that. Hi, my name is Jared Austin. I am the founding member and president of the Green Party Alliance at the University of South Florida Tampa campus. Greens will overhaul the financial industries to end their culture of impunity and to prevent them from committing fraud or malfeasance so severe as to drive our nation into a massive recession or depression. Since finance, banking, and insurance institutions occupy a privileged position of power at the center of commerce, this special advantage brings with it special social responsibilities. We must ensure that the institutions chartered for these roles take that responsibility seriously and serve the public interest. Green Solutions for Banking Reform Break up our nation's largest banks and financial institutions so that none is too big to fail. End taxpayer-funded bailouts for banks, insurers, and other financial companies and reversing the U.S. government bailouts of speculators who engaged in mortgage fraud and other related financial crimes. Regulate all financial derivatives. Reenact the Glass-Steagall Act, which prohibited bank holding companies from owning other financial companies and engaging in risky economic transactions. Ensure that low and middle income people have access to banking services, affordable loans, and small business supporting capital, especially through credit unions. Prosecute criminal banking speculation. Impose a moratorium on foreclosures. To read off our full platform on the economy, please visit www.gp.org. All right, great. Well, here we are back, and I'd like to introduce um, Dale Schumacher the CEO of Tampa Bay Federal Credit Union, and that's a local, local banking. And uh, Chris Thomas, a professor at USF, uh, associate professor of economics and exide professor of sustainable enterprise. And Dr. Farid Kvari, a PhD and economist and creator of zero cost economics, and also state banking, uh, you have a state banking proposal and he ran for governor of the state in the last election, the one before, as an independent. Okay, welcome, gentlemen. And um, do you have an opening statement that you'd like to uh, say, Mr. Schumacher? Or Dale, can I call you Dale? D yes, please. Okay, fine. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And I'm pleased to be here today. Uh, you know, my focus is primarily on uh, consumer finance and whether it be, uh, you know, accumulating retirement funds for the future or saving for uh, your children's college education or borrowing money to buy a home or an automobile. Those are my areas of, of expertise and uh, you know, hope to be able to bring some knowledge uh, of that to the sustainable economic discussion that we have. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, <clears throat> and Professor Thomas. I'm pleased Chris. to be here as well. And uh, I want to offer my expertise, if you will, in economics and the economics of sustainable enterprise um, or economics where we, we focus on using resources as efficiently as possible. Um, the idea being that we want to maximize social welfare, make sure that resources are not used inefficiently. Okay. Dr. Kapari? Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I am an economist. I have studied b both views the conservatives as well as the Marxism. I got my master's degree from the University of Hamburg in Germany and uh, my PhD from University of Bremen in Germany. And I looked at both economic concepts and I don't think it will serve anybody because it didn't do so far. Still poverty is there and uh, nobody has economic security, which is the necessity of every human being to have it. And that's why I developed a concept called the zero cost economics. And that is what we should, it should will, uh, make possible that we create lasting prosperity in an environmentally safe, 
as well as economic security for the people. And I would be glad to talk about it. Great. Okay. Well, we'll hear more about that later. And uh, I guess I'd like to get started with um, um, your opinion, Chris, on um, fundamental linkage upon a rich economy. We have the well, what do you feel? That well, makes I the economy think it's important role? in all of this sustainable uh, discourse to remember that uh, successful economies, rich economies, if you will, are the countries that can truly afford uh, to engage in uh, green investments, sustainable enterprise, and and you, when you look worldwide, you see that it's the rich rich countries that have the cleanest environments, including this uh, country, which has a very strong EPA and other environmental rules and, and laws that we have to follow. Uh, poor countries really can't uh, do the kinds of things that we can do. They don't hold a value for that. Oh, they may have a value for it, but they're living hand to mouth or they don't have uh, the uh, infrastructure resources, the capital, financial capital, they, may, they just um, can't make the kinds of uh, sacrifices. Remember, there's no free lunch. If you want a cleaner environment, you have to devote resources to making it cleaner. And those resources have to come from somewhere. Richer economies have more resources that they can devote to uh, cleaning up the environment. Okay, and I, I think we could probably do a better job of that. Um, I, I know that we do have it. You're, I think that's a great point that there's countries that have no value on it and they, um, like sadly, Haiti was exploited to where they got rid of all their trees and therefore they had a poor economy based on the fact there was, they lost that environmental aspect of having trees as shelter, trees to, you know, to um, use for firewood, that's what they were used for instead of maybe, you know, propagating more crops or you know, using them in a in a system that would be sustainable, like you know, um, fruit trees or some sort of export um, economy. Sue, so, what do you have to say about yes, um, yes, as far as what I think is this? We have we are not a rich country. We are not. When you look uh, recently, I okay. had some statistics seen that 62 percent of Americans are one paycheck away from being on the street. This is a reality and you will be testifying that uh, or at least agree with me. <laughs> and this is the problem we have. We are a rich country as such, we have everything, but it is not distributed evenly and safely and correctly between all the people. And that's a big problem we are having in the United States. And technology, it depends on what kind of technology we should be using. Solar energy is good but not the centralized solar energy. Decentralized, we have to use it. And that is that creates jobs, that create prosperity. You see, the problem is the cost and the social cost which rises. This is the biggest problem we are having in the United States and elsewhere in the, in the world. And when you look at, at the, all the economic concepts are out there, you see that social costs and reoccurring costs are neglected. And this is a fact of life that Sooner or later, either you get retired or you lose your job. And at that point, what will happen is that you have to live on your fixed income and, uh, and some social security. And if you outlive your f uh, savings, which you live on it, then you end up in poor house. That's the reality of the life. And or this, we streets. have to change it. Yeah. We have to change it. And zero cost economy uh, concentrate on freezing the cost, cost, social costs and reoccurring costs, uh, reducing it, and wherever it is possible to eliminate it. Okay. And that is like solar energy, interest, uh, insurance costs. This can be reduced. Right now, healthcare costs, we could cr reduce it at least 50% of it overnight by increasing productivity in healthcare system. And this, we do not have it. And people, are losing their income, no matter how you look at it. Look at the bankers, what they do. That is, interest can, cannot go any higher than what is gone on the loans and mortgages. On the saving, it could not go any lower than what is at present time. You will agree with that. And then, all the, look at all the fees and all the 
charges that people are paying, jobs are outsourced to China right. and elsewhere. Well, right, and, and that's we're all talking about like the money from mm. them. And then the rich people want to sell to these poor people something. And but how they, they do it, I don't know. How they're going to buy it? You're yeah. talking about this it. This is the, the problem I'm the having. The power. Right now. Okay, and the power I don't of see a dollar. Any way they can do it. Okay, well, and and that's under. Uh, we'll we'll get back to that. We'll take a little break, but um. I just, that's one of the things where you're saying that if we only keep the money at the top, then there's not going to be someone to buy. If all they can do is pay for the bare minimum, they're not going to be able to save at a bank. They're not going to be able to put any money away. Um, but we'll get back. We're going to um, take just one quick break. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, um, we would like to see what the advantage would be, if any, of moving our money out of large world banks and investing in state banks, local banks, and credit unions where we keep the capital local. What do you have to say about that, Dale? Well, I would say, that, you know, first of all, credit unions are different from banks you know, from a governance standpoint. Uh, we're owned by the, the members that use the, the credit union. So when you talk about how profits are distributed, they're distributed back to the to the membership or to the ownership uh, directly through reduced services, I'm sorry, increased services <laughs> or reduced interest rates is what I in intended to say there. And, um, you know, that, that works very well. So um, the board of directors is uh, made up of members of the credit union. They're local people from the local uh, community, generally from uh, specific employers or um, uh, other kinds of uh, common common groups. So that, that helps make those decisions more locally. Now, um, you know, because we're local, yeah, the money, the money is invested locally through loans to small business, to consumers. But, um, you know, the, the large money center banks um, invest locally as well, where, where I think you see the difference is how the, the profits are distributed and where they go. And of course, they go to stockholders who could be anywhere in the world as opposed to in a local community somewhere. So that, that, that would primarily be the difference and why it would make sense to support local financial institutions. Okay. And um, any thoughts on that as far as, you said you like the competition, Chris, of the more the merrier banks or right. even so? Right. In economics, we like competition. Competition uh, creates usually the kinds of incentives and uh, market forces that ensure that uh, you know, consumers get the best deal they can. Uh, I was concerned in the 1980s when we were deregulating banking uh, and allowing interstate banking. I was concerned that we would end up losing all of the local banks here in Florida and we would end up with mm -hmm. only money center banks, mm -hmm. which would lead to an increase in concentration, less competition. <laughs> that was a concern to me back then. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how Dale feels about the the uh, way that that's played out. Do we still have a viable local bank uh, industry? And I don't, I'm not an expert, so I don't know, but that would be <coughs> where I think that the, the idea of competition is important. Mm -hmm. <coughs> is that? Well, yeah, go ahead. Nick, okay. Well, um, we'll yeah, I, I'd say we still have a local institutional uh, footprint, but I would also say that, you know, much of what we see is local banks will start they, they have used a phrase in the banking industry for a decade or so now called de novo banks that, be, yeah. that crop up and they're around for three or four years. The investors uh, create a footprint in the community and then sell to one of the larger money center banks. Mm. And it's, it's about operating efficiency. Uh, the, efficient, um, the efficient institutions are the ones that survive. And you know, I heard a colleague a number of years ago talk about comparing financial institutions to the airline industry and all the consolidation that has occurred in the airline industry is, is very similar to the consolidation that's going on right now in, in the financial services in that only the most efficient of those organizations are, are really surviving and thriving and coming out um, in the end. And of course the um, you know Great Recession as it was called uh, of the, the uh, you know, nine, the 2010, 2011, in that in that range, mm -hmm. really caused a huge number of uh, consolidations to occur, and and that really <coughs> helped drive up those uh, operating efficiencies. And and while um, you know there are still service fees in place that occur, uh, you know the interest rate margins are much narrower than they have been in the in the recent past, and as 
you know, forced institutions to become more efficient. How long has Tampa Bay Federal been around? So. Uh, 80 years. 80 years. Uh, well, I guess they 19, survived it. 1935. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Doctor, you are, you are interested in uh, forming a state bank of Florida, which we don't have. Now, there are state banks in, like, uh, what is it, North, North Dakota. North Dakota. Oh, you do see, you want to give us an overview of that? Yes. First of all, I would like to introduce something. Sure. Uh, talk about a uh, different subject. You see, mm -hmm. money is no more than air and water and land should not be treated any differently. Okay. Money, as we use water and to grow, and land to grow fruits and vegetables, money should be used to- As a resource. Resources to fertilize the economic growth, create prosperity and uh, economic security for the people. Now, if you look at the Fed, and they say that there is a correlation between unemployment and Inflation, I, the, the famous Phillips curve that you may well know, there is no such a thing. By definition, it is a seesaw. And oh. seesaw, that says there is no balance. And at present time, eventually, there will be, seesaw goes up and down. At this case, it goes and hit inflation and unemployment had and had they uh, damaged the whole thing. Now, the Germans, they were talking about the mag magic triangle. There should be a balance between uh, unemployment, uh, inflation, and uh, budget. This, no matter how you look at it, by definition, there is never, uh, you know, if you make a balance between the, that triangle, there is always a deficit, always there will be unemployment and inflation. And this is the problem we are having. And our economic growth is built on social cost okay. and reoccurring costs. And I have a chart which, unfortunately, we cannot see now, well, but can, it will be it, there. It puts on the screen, yeah. yes. We they can, can see, see the difference between economic growth in, the, in conventional economic system as opposed to uh, zero-cost economics. Okay. And in zero-cost economics, the green area, it shows the economic uh, growth and prosperity for the people. And as I mentioned earlier, when uh, if the costs keep rising too fast, uh, co uh, rising, and the income may rise, but eventually it comes a time when you lose your job or you are un uh, or you retire, right. you have to live on fixed income, and you end up in poor house if you yes. outlive all that thing. So money, we must use it as such to achieve economic growth for the people, the environmentally safe prosperity, and the econ economic security for the people. And this is not happening. And the state bank should be doing that, exactly that. It is a common good. Money is a common good. It should be treated that way. And I cannot see, I, and I cannot see that if this trend continues as it's going right now, the banks are going to fall apart. So, and and they words, should you're, be interested in state bank. You're looking at money as, as opposed to like me owning all the water or me owning all the air. Yeah. That you, if you own all the money, you're going to be stuck with all the money, but then not any this services. Is exactly what's <laughs> no, happening no. right now. Yeah, which is kind of why people want a, a living wage and so on. But, uh, but are, are, you familiar, are you familiar, Chris, with that German triangle? I've never heard of that before, but... Is it, no, I'm not. Oh, okay, but that's because you were educated in Germany. Yeah, too, in Germany, so. they okay. thought I could not so, find in some person. You showed me. I saw some pictures of it, and it was kind of a. Tri it always kept being a triangle, but it changed shape from my classes to yeah, a. Because you know, if doing, you decrease the unemployment, then it goes like this. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. So it's right. by definition, it's wrong. That is wrong too, okay. because it's seesaw all the time. So you're all for keeping money local again, local, it with it working and here. liquid in the state. Yeah, liquid in the state. And you should, you should, earlier you mentioned about profit, mm -hmm. which it's true. But we have a social profit and social benefit. That must stay in the state of Florida as for the Floridians. And that is the problem. If the profit leaves from the state of Florida and goes to Wisconsin or New York, that doesn't do us any good. I'm just not familiar with the social profit concept. Right, right. And, but, you know, and you're familiar with this, your idea of the profiting and of economics being sustainable and profitable would be 
But you see, social profit oh. is this. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I'm going I'm to ask Chris that, but okay. then you can explain what social profit is. But yeah. Do you have a what is economic? Yeah, your, profit? economic. Yeah, just your what you're thinking of is when you when you speak to your students. Well, and, you're and, I, them. and I do that frequently. Absolutely. Usually, of course, I'm in the business school or yes. teach business economics right. courses, and uh, you know, I just remind them profit's not a four-letter word like you might think if all you listen to is the news. Profit is the measure of how well your company is is doing. Is it creating goods and services that are valuable to consumers who are voluntarily going to buy these things? And can you do it at a low cost? And can mm -hmm. you do it within the laws of the land? Uh, and right. That is, meet the environmental laws and so on. And can you do it and then have some money left over to compensate the investors? Because without investors, you won't have businesses. You won't have a firm. Economic profit is the fabric. It is the foundation of capitalism. And I know that a lot of people think there's something wrong with that. <clears throat> but that said, it, uh, it's created a huge amount of wealth that, while you might not like the way it's distributed, is still the most successful economic system in the history of mankind. And capitalism is where we have the cleanest environments. The well, nations that have embraced capitalism and the nations that have the greatest amount of economic profit can afford clean environments. And uh, so that's the, that's the angle uh, well, that I come at it from. But I understand there are differing viewpoints. Yes, and you're being from a university or used to debate. And, and, but I, but I, I'm also going to say, too, that you know, you're right about, I, I really love the point of that we do have that awareness that environment is important and that there is uh, actions taken. Well, and interestingly, though, I do have to point out that in the United States, there are dumping grounds. If you go to Louisiana, they have the lowest you know, um, restrictions for environmental protection, you know, even though there's an EPA, they're, they're on the bottom and they also economically are on the bottom. Mississippi, same way. When you go to the the states that have the most, you got California, the seventh, the last I knew was the seventh well, uh, highest economy in the world. And their restrictions are very, very <clears throat> stringent. And then you have New England and they have a higher standard. I mean, so it kind of, you know, they call it, it was a study I read that was green and gold and meaning that the green being environmental and the gold being money, um, that the people that were paid more, that had the higher standards, had a better, you know, they did have better jobs and they had a better, you know, cleaner atmosphere and way of life. And so it all kind of went hand in hand. So I, I would argue we need to make Louisiana wealthier so that okay. they don't have to be a dumping ground. All right. Yes. You see, I... Respectfully, I would not agree with you I, that we have I, clean. I sensed uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> because all you need is to go and look at, at our rivers and see what's happening there. Go to Key Biscayne and see, I will give you $100 if you take a bath in that water. Uh, you know. Yeah, well, that won't cover my gasoline, but if you raise the price, <laughs> I'll be there. No, I mean, I mean, my true price. yeah, this is. <laughs> It is not clean. We, it looks like it's clean, but it mm -hmm. is not. Did, you, and, live, did and you live in the United States back in the 1960s, before the EPA? I came to uh, it's so much nicer the United here States now. in 2000, uh, not 1968. Oh. I went to California. You I know it was a lot terrible. It. Yeah, it, uh, all your color was black. Mm -hmm. Every day you had to put a new one. Soap suds in the rivers. Yeah. Uh, smog and those. Dates. But still, you see, we have to have a clean water, which we do not have it. This is a fact of fracking is no need for it. So we want to get better. Oil, I yeah. bet you that's clean. Yeah, oil, oil we don't need. I yes. wrote my dissertation about oil. I wrote about energy uh, and uh, this back in 70s. And, uh, and, uh, and I published around 10 books about this subject. Okay. All we need is solar energy decentralized hemp which we do not agree and we and algae we can use all the dirty water in our glades and grow algae convert it to algae oil and it will be cheaper and water is so precious today and in fresh water fresh water 10 15 years 20 years down the road that will cost we could sell it more than we can get for a, a barrel of oil and that is, that is the wealth we are destroying just to get oil. Mm -hmm. And this has to stop. And in Florida, all the Everglades grow hemp and convert it to hemp oil. And run your car on that. 
Yeah, there are some money. solutions out there, but for some reason they're money. held back by, by the industry. And, and, and if you're FPNL, sounds like a movie. Really? Sir, if you're an FPNL <laughs> and you want to make money, manufacture solar system, decentralized. You won't live long enough to see even half of Florida is solarized. Nobody will live that long. And so make money that way. Look at the invest, Pan Am. Invest in solar. Okay. Yeah. Look at Pan Am. Look at Eastern Airline. Look at American Airlines. Yeah. If, look Very at GM. GM well, was the g biggest uh, company in the world. Now look at this. this is a, uh, if I could say something optimistic. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm a lot more optimistic. And, and what we've seen is the financial opportunity to profit from solar energy has led to a substantial amount of research and development in photovoltaic cells. And we've had some major breakthroughs yeah. in just the past few years. And what's going to make the solar happen is that investment of profit into research and development and lowering the cost of solar. Oh, I'd, I'd love to have solar at my house. I'd like to drive an electric powered car. Yes. Okay, these would all be great things. But at this point in time, the most efficient energy for my car is still gasoline. And uh, well, so we'll, we'll, get there when the, we'll get there when the prices are right. Yeah, there's different schools of thought, but I guess that is true. That's the investment that we make. And so um, I, I guess that's, Kind of where I, I would have to say that I have bought solar stock. I have a solar water heater in my house, so I've made my investment that way, and I got money back from the state. So I mean, it's, it's little things that we can do, and it has saved me money. And I also use solar and wind to dry my clothes, which is a clothesline. I was like, throw that. <laughs> no, that's yes, something. What? You see, I have been in solar so, business. I came to the United States to Florida to solarize, solarize Florida when I was a young guy. And I had a company, and today all the evacuated high temperature collector that's being used in China. I was the first guy who developed it, and, I, and in 85, we just got married with my wife, and a, delegate, a Chinese delegate came to my factory in Miami, and uh, I was asked by the U.S. Department of Energy to give them a tour. And back then, the Chinese, you know how they were. Uh, nothing exciting like no. 85, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they didn't have even two dollars in their pockets. Uh, I want to say that respectfully. And I gave them a evacuated high temperature solar collector that was uh, designed and developed in Hialeah in Miami. And uh, now look at it. So I understand a bit about that. And then I grew up in Yazd, a city in central Iran. And uh, there we had solar homes, very primitive, but we had the uh, temperature during summer month, which was over 120 degree. Mm -hmm. We had around 60 degree in our house with a wind tower. And this technology, if you go to my zero cost ec uh, economy.com site, you see a model of solar house. It does not cost more than a tower to put there to capture the wind and you know, Physics, heat rises up when mm -hmm. the right. uh, air flows down. I even know that. And, pardon? I said, I even know that. <coughs> yeah, <laughs> and so <laughs> it used to cool that thing. <laughs> so the cost is not that big. And I had a solar home myself during the, until uh, Hurricane Andrew destroyed it. And this was mm -hmm. running on solar. The solar subsidy, I do not agree with that because that is uh, fatal because you buy a solar system for 5000 and say, give me $10,000 bill because I get the tax credit and I get, that doesn't work. You have to have a low financing, like 2% for solar energy. Okay. And, you and think that uh, banks should get into financing solar course, in the state? Is that a good investment? What do you money? think, Dale? Well, we, you know, in the past, um, not, not so much today, um, you know, in 2015, but in the past we have offered uh, energy efficient loan or loans for inter energy efficient automobile purchases and things okay. like that hybrid cars and and whatnot to try to encourage that and you know the irony of it is this morning you know driving in I noticed uh, that my local gas station had a dollar 91 cents uh, you know regular gas price and what we're seeing in our business now is you know people are moving away from the energy efficient vehicles back into the larger uh, you know SUVs. SUVs, hate to say it, but it's yes. true. 
Yeah, and, that's, and, and he's smiling. He's well, smiling. and but that's what they're doing it because it's more it's more comfortable. It's you know it's a better ride. All those things that go along with over the road kinds of travel that you might like to do, and you know it's much it's much better to drive from here to Miami in an SUV than it would be in a, in a very small uh, fuel efficient vehicle. So people are going to opt for the larger vehicle. And now that you know interest rates are at historic lows and and oil pri prices are back down uh, to a very affordable range. We're seeing that happen. Yeah, so yeah. that's the trend that you're seeing. Yeah. And, and but I'm just saying that you're you're dying your head as far as like it's market driven. It's these are what people are. You know, we have to go with what people want. Do you feel? And I mean, that's and I understand that. Do you feel that if we is there a ways to tweak what people want that something better? Or do you feel that's messing with their? Well, tweak. Yeah. As an economist, I think the way you tweak is yeah. you offer different price incentives. Price is a signal. If you want people to use less gasoline, raise the price. Mm -hmm. If you want them to use uh, more gasoline, lower the price. And that's what we're seeing happen. I mean, it's rational behavior. Right. Gasoline so prices so fall, so it's they, less important to drive the Prius. And uh, they still have the Prius. It's probably right. in the garage waiting for gasoline prices to go up again. But right. maybe they decided to lease a, an SUV for uh, a 24-month lease for now. Who knows? Right. But as Dale says, people like larger cars. They're mm -hmm. nicer, they're more comfortable. If the price of having that comfort goes down, it, not surprisingly, consumers are going to consu okay. consume more of it. Yeah, and I guess the thing is, uh, deep down, that we are subsidizing oil, the oil industry, for research and development. Are we? we yeah, and, and we're subsidizing solar less. Subsidizing? And we're, yeah, and we actually, like, How is that? nuclear power has to be insured by the government. Oh, I thought you were talking about no. oil. I've well, also, and I'm, and I'm oh, adding to that, like nuclear power is is subsidized by the government because we insure it, because it has to be federally insured, because they, <coughs> um, no private investor in a free economy will touch it. It's like, whoa, not, I'm not going to mess with nuclear. So I guess the thing is, is that we do as a government, government isn't a problem really if it can be working for the, the right goals, and that would be an overall profitability um, and I mean, the thing is that lobbyists are there from different companies, and they're going to lobby for what they want. And um, as far as I want to get back to, it, I, I'll be the one to pick on large world banks, multinational <laughs> banks, but I will say I won't put anyone on the spot on with that. But but I would just say that you can have um, you know Citibank or Chase Manhattan walk into a congressman's office and plop down something, you know. <laughs> Or one of their lobbyists, basically, not them, you know, not not Jamie or some Diamond. I mean, but, but although he could probably get access, but anyway, um, you could have someone walk in and drop a bill down and say, "We'd like this passed. Get work on this. Get this in, in your committee. We know you're in the committee for banking, um, and get this passed. And it's all written by us. It's in favoring us, and it's trying to cut out the smaller banks, the so more local." Um, and it's cutting out things that they don't want investment in. They have their, their investors are in a certain niche and they're going to promote what they're in. That only makes sense to them. And so when they do that, lobbyists can be the problem for having a better solution with better um, long term, uh, what should I say, long term profitability for everyone. And not, not getting into like saying socialism, because we're not socialists. Greens feel like if you have a great idea, you should profit from that. If you have um, work really hard, you should profit from that. We're not looking to say everybody gets the same thing. We're all standing on a bread line here. We're all going to get. It. We're saying that you know. To, but there's also, you know, fairness. And some people do. You know, when you have a lot of money, you can make more money. Well, you look like you want to say something. You see something. about Friedman. You spoke free market and market me mechanism and so on. When. And then you say, if we decide, who decide that we drive a Pinto or a van? If the government decide, then you say, oh, where is where Friedman fits in it? So I believe personally, and there is no market mecha uh, mechanism between uh, energy prices. If the oil prices, this was I realized back in seventies, if the oil prices keep rising. There will never happen that there is a substitution between alternative energy and oil price. Because the minute 
the alternative energy rise, uh, drops, the oil price will drop too. And it goes six suck, six suck, six suck, and never the substitution will take place. And we will run out of uh, crude oil one day sooner or later. We'll never run out of crude oil. Yeah, but not really? in our life, but, oh. <clears throat> but the cost will be so environmentally so expensive. To extract at, at, it? And fracking and so on. And that part I understand uh, very well. And I wrote Environomic, the Economics of Environmentally Safe Prosperity back in 1993, a few months earlier than Al Gore's book. It got published. So that part taking into consideration we have to be able to drive the big SUV. We should be able to do all the nice things we want to do because we live in America, because we have the technology, we have the opportunity. What we do not have is leadership and, and, a, and an economic plan. When you talk about government, who do we put there? We put a firefighter in charge of oh. uh, a, a, a big city like Miami, to run that place. And we put a corporate raider as governor <laughs> in the state of Florida who destroys jobs and you expect from him to create jobs. I don't yeah. want to sound like no. I'm uh, well, campaigning, but this is what is happening. So when a person doesn't understand all his life he learned how to destroy jobs, and, uh, and I don't want to talk about Medicare and all yeah. this thing, how did he create anything that he could do it right now? This is the problem we are having with our leaders. A lawyer, you know that better, law is a static discipline. Economic is a dynamic. And when we pass a law that we create a job, that job is social cost. You have to create jobs in terms of uh, putting a lot of police on the street, firefighters and so on, that is social cost. What we have to create in the free market, that you cannot legislate it. You need economic plan for that, and that is missing. Okay. And we do not have people to do it. And they have no candidate. You can go throughout America, anywhere in the world, nobody has a plan. They have party, they have party mm -hmm. dogmas, and they stick right. to it, and party money, and they get elected. Right, well, I mean, I guess we could speak, or we were speaking about oil, a carbon tax because we know that there is there is a cost to putting pollution in the air and I don't know if that's you know that's a solution to have a bit more of a balance because there are certain energies that aren't you know they're not going to cause damage to the environment like solar we have the, the largest nuclear reactor that we know of <laughs> so it's 93 million miles away and it'll still burn our skin if we're out in it too long so it's the sun does, is where oil, where all the fossil fuels got their original energy from. So I, I, it just, to me, makes common sense to utilize that and to you know, promote it more. Um, all right, well, um, let's, get, let's kind of dive back into ways where people can invest better, spend better, save better. Dale, you got some, um, get some advice on that. I'm sure you do. Uh, yes, thank you for the opportunity. Sure. I think. Um, it's, it seems to me that systematic savings is is a really important component of uh, you know developing that lasting prosperity uh, that we talked about earlier. Um, you know, people that um, you know, I guess, save for a rainy day. Um, you know, one of these days that rainy day does occur, and they've they've got some some accumulation of savings. But it it seems to me that it's easier for us if it's a systematic approach and not uh, well, let's wait till next week. I'll see if I have any money left over, then I can put it away. But if I do some systematic uh, approach to it, that would be good. Another part of savings, which I don't think many people really think about, is the whole concept of borrowing wisely. Um, you know, if, you're, if you borrow for long-term economic value, uh, that makes sense. If you, if you borrow for current consumption, um, that makes less sense. Okay, so uh, for example, example, okay. Yeah. okay right. For example, uh, to, to purchase a home or to buy an automobile to, for transportation to and from work, you know, it makes sense to, uh, to perhaps borrow money to do that. But 
you know, we're talking about gasoline and, and oil prices, but to, to borrow money to buy gas to go to work, you're consuming it immediately, yet you want to defer the payment into the future, and, and that that's, doesn't make good sense. Um, you know, if you, if you need, and I, you know, and I regularly use a credit card to purchase gasoline, but at the end of the month I pay it off. Mm -hmm. I, don't, right. I don't carry the balance forward. So Accumulating I, I would, interest on a credit card is like the worst. Yeah. So if, we're gonna give, if any of us are going to give advice to anyone, it's like, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I guess the, you know, the final point that I would make about um, the whole savings component and, and spending better is, is the whole idea of investment. Once you've, once you've accumulated a sufficient amount of um, resources to consider longer term savings, money that you may not need for five years or ten years, um, and I'm not advocating that you would um, tie it up that long, but that you would start to consider an investment strategy rather than a savings strategy. And that investment strategy, I, I think, it makes sense from my perspective at least for a three-prong approach where you, you talk about safety, is my, is my investment safe? Um, how much of it is at risk? Uh, and, and certainly there are varying degrees of risk uh, and the different kinds of risk, <laughs> interest rate risk, market risk, those kinds of things. Then the second part is liquidity. If you really realize, if you really think that you're not gonna need the money for five years, for example, uh, perhaps a, uh, some sort of a bond investment um, which has a time, you have to keep it in for a certain amount of time. That, that, that might make some sense. And then, and then finally, you know, consider yield. Yield should be the last consideration because there is a direct correlation between risk and yield. And the higher yield that you might receive on an investment, the more risky that investment likely is. So um, you have to make that trade off. So th right. those are some things that I would cons ask okay. people to consider. <coughs> well, that all makes sense. If I add a few things. Sure, sure, sure. You see, that is from the banker's viewpoint. Mm -hmm. But if you pay f on a mortgage for 30 years, you're not going to save too much money. So what you have to do is, as a homeowner, you have to make sure that, first of all, you get a uh, low interest rate. Right. And secondly, pay it off as soon as you sure. can. Oh, and he's not and saying you should. Because but that yeah. is the way to do it. Yeah. And, uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, because that's, I mean, that's, well, and again, it's a free market and, and banks do need to make money. People do yeah, have a job. They do it, but as a like, consumer, yeah, as a yeah, consumer as a consumer, to right. no, no. do it. And in then, and then you eliminate all your reoccurring costs. And mm -hmm. how do you do that? You go, instead of using electricity, you use solar system, decentralized. Right. So okay. yeah, if yeah. today you saved $100 on your and electrical that's an bill. too. Right. You could invest in a solar system. You could. Would be yeah. what you'd call a you know, wise investment. I hate to get into that conversation because mm -hmm. I'm nowhere near an expert at it. But oh. it seems wind makes more sense to me than solar. Okay. And, and All I, right. well, I've lived in places where the wind really generated lots of... It depends okay. on the location right. what yeah. you yeah. have to so, do. Okay. And Go then okay. uh, reoccurring costs, you have to reduce it, uh, freeze it, reduce it, eliminate it. Three words always you, when you make it... Uh, financial deci decision, you have to make sure that see how it going to look in long term, and do everything in your in perspective that you freeze the cost, reduce the cost, or eliminate the cost. Then you can build savings for the old age, and then you have to make look into alternative. What yields more, a two percent CD or an investment somewhere else in mm -hmm. something else. Mm -hmm. Now, these are the issues that one, I think one should be looking from sure. the economic standpoint. Well, and that's it. Maybe so. Then borrow. It could make sense to borrow money from a credit union to invest in. What's to say solar in the state? Yeah, cre because credit I, union like is next saying, to you, state bank. Is a little brother of the state bank. Mm -hmm. Because if you if yeah. you like do if you invest uh, uh, in like a solar panel, let's say. It's going to cost you more than you can probably just pay out of pocket, but it does save you money. So it's a wise investment from that standpoint because they usually last. The, the, some of the solar panels are still in use from the 70s. Mm -hmm. So there's, there are a lot of them are guaranteed I like 25, have the 30 years. one penny bill on my house before yeah. Hurricane Andrew. And it yeah. would be a good uh, banking practice to offer that low interest rate for solar system and solar homes. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. It's in this state especially because yeah. it just almost makes common sense. And and again, you're talking about common sense, right, Chris? I mean, as far economics as economics is nothing but formalized common sense. Right. And and however, I must say. Uh, mortgage rates are so low right now. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> if I can get a three hundred thousand dollar loan for four percent for thirty years, mm -hmm. I'm taking that. I don't want to pay it off. I want to hang on to that three hundred thousand because I'm certain over the next thirty years I'll have a chance to earn much greater than a four percent rate of return in some other financial investment. And so I like these low interest rates mm -hmm. for that reason. When interest rates are high, uh, I do try to pay off my mortgage at a more rapid rate, right. but I see these low interest rates on a, on a mortgage as being a great opportunity uh, that you lock in for, for a long time, mm -hmm. and that's just me. Well, okay, but so you're advocating my home risk, buying. My risk profile. Yeah, well, right. but I think that makes but, sense. But advocating, like buying a home, I mean, not every, it doesn't work for everybody if you're gonna be moving really soon, you gotta try to sell it. You know, I, I know of a, a family, they were military and they bought a house in Jacksonville and then he was sent somewhere else and they had to try to quick sell it and that was when the costs were going down. They were just lucky just to, you know, get out of it with paying $40,000. Yeah. I mean, that's they were able to sell it high enough but it was right after, you know, the bubble happened. Yeah. And so that kind of thing. But but normally, like like you're saying, with the, with the interest rate where we're at, it does make sense to get something solid. But you don't get anything. But they don't give you because you, you are not credit worthy. Ah, because you're, you're you lost your, you have no that... jobs. Because you ha your home is foreclosed. So uh -huh. a, few, a few weeks ago, a banker said, we want to lend money, but those who we want to lend them, they don't want our money. And mm -hmm. what do you think will happen to the banks? In yeah, the so in other words, the people... And the next Republican government uh, president will not bail, bail out the banks, I think. Hmm. Unless Obama get the third term. Wow, the bank <laughs> bailout, we don't... Hope the not. First, the first, yeah. he can't, well, he can't. Well, just because that would be a, another violation of the law. No, but. I mean. <laughs> yeah, I think they, they stopped that. It but, could be yeah. a war, and yeah. the president in the midst of a war, remember yeah. well, Roosevelt. Well, here's, yeah, well, here's, yeah. here's, yeah. I mean, I'm not that proud of any of our politicians, so yeah. let me just yeah. go on record. I'm, no, I'm not picking, I'm not picking not, on Obama. Not, I wouldn't want anybody, I wouldn't want anybody to have three terms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, you know, the Green Party, we're also saying, you know, Obama is not that liberal, <laughs> or not really. So I mean, he's, there's a lot of, you know, and that's the way the politics, unfortunately, is gone. Is that it's, it's very, very expensive to run for office, and maybe with the best person isn't getting in there because the fact that they can't afford it, and they, you know, so it's kind of like the devil you know, the devil you don't know, and people that's how people are voting now or not voting, but um, that's getting off off topic. But but just the fact that there are you know. May I speak it's from a, my oh, experience? From your One experience second. and what? You see, never during the two times I ran, not a single person asked me what is your plan with oh, the exception no. of they the Green Party. Yeah. Yeah. All they asked was how much money you raised. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I was offered a lot of money yeah. from different sources, but they, always there was a string attached to it and I didn't want to do it. And so nobody paid attention to me, never a single person asked yeah. me. What is your plan? See, and that's all they wanted, how much money you raised. Yeah. I and mean, money was not raised. We're Who losing. They, they were given to them. We're losing the substance of, of what, you yeah. know, the politicians should be running for. Um, what about, um, do you think that we should impose financial transaction fees on trades, stocks, bonds, currency, derivatives, and other financial instruments? Is there more of a, I mean, we tax paychecks. Well, we also tax income uh, that is derived from those trades. So yeah. it seems to me there's already a tax associated with it. And okay, I, I'm not sure You're that. You're good with it. I mean, yeah, I don't think I, I would not advocate that. It, okay. You know, unless, unless you, there were more details that were more well, yeah. overwhelmingly in support of it. But I just, on the surface, it just doesn't. Not a blanket. No. Thing. Okay. And Chris, you don't want to see a. Do no, I don't see any market? efficiency reason for doing that. Okay. Um. All right. And I do not either. Okay. Okay. So, um, what about people like for wage workers, exempt people earning less than twenty-five thousand a year, and families earning less than fifty thousand a year? Does that seem from federal and state? We already don't have state taxes right. here, 
so we've already done that in Florida. How, how do you think that that's working as far as the state? It seems to be Rick Scott is touting that as something good, bringing in people, more people in the state. We're number three now. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? I have a lot of thoughts. A lot of thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, that would be, if I'm... Yeah. I find it is the worst way of creating job. That is another exploitation of other, res other, uh, other people's resources, as he did with Medicare, he's doing now with other states. We can create jobs, super middle class jobs, in the state of Florida, without subsidies and without tax, uh, taxpayers' money. And how can we do that? A governor should be able to mobilize uh, demand. Demand is what creates jobs, not subsidies and so on. Well, when, and yeah, we're subsidizing. Yeah, subsidizing. We're subsidizing welfare a lot in the yeah, lower when, wages. Let, you both look like you want to say something. Well, you know, and again, um, it's a little out of my area of expertise, but it, it, it seems to me that part of the issue that, that we're talking about here is the idea of um, competing with other states. If other states are going to offer subsidies for businesses to come there, like, you know, for example, the state of Texas, I'm sure offers a, a good deal of subsidy. Why shouldn't we at least be on a level playing field? And to, to, to level that playing field, you know, we probably have to offer some su foreign yeah. subsidies. But, but Rick Scott did already 250,000, uh, 250 million dollar and what he got. Okay. Well, uh, the, we didn't get the 700,000 jobs he was saying yeah. so far yet, but Chris, even, you were going to expand on that? I think that one of the ways the sense. states can compete uh, most successfully is what they're doing now. Uh, what we're seeing is get rid of the state income tax. Texas, Florida, big, I mean, this big migration of workers here. I'm not so sure that it's important to offer subsidies to individual businesses to move. If you don't have a state income tax, uh, that creates a great deal of economic viability, and that alone is, is pretty attractive. Just for the people that would come, yeah. the workers, the CEOs, the, the, right? Well, so they would I, I'm not a macroeconomist. Okay. All right, I want to tell you I'm not. Okay. However, when you look at, in some sense, the macro effects of, of lower taxes, especially not having mm -hmm. a state income tax, I think that that's the way we're moving. We're seeing states now look at eliminating their state income taxes. Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, mm. Georgia. These are states that are trying to compete successfully with Texas and Florida. If you take the Texas economy out of the U.S. economy, there's nothing left in terms of, of economic growth. It's all happening in Texas. Mm. So now, I, who in knows California? exactly why? I'm not a macroeconomist, but I do think that Possibly one of the most important things going on in Texas is, again, no state income tax. We think that's important in Florida. Georgia thinks it's important if they want to compete with Florida. So okay. I, I throw that out there as a thought. Okay. Yeah. And, and we know, I know you've got to get to class. You're, you're I getting have, close. I have a three, yeah. Yeah. So do you want to, I just want, before we take a break and say goodbye, do you want to... Yeah. Okay. Do you want us to have some closing words to? Closing words. Yeah. What you? Well, I'm an economist, and 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 uh, economics was dubbed the dismal science uh, a couple centuries ago, and and I would say that actually economics and the way we think about the economic way of thinking about the real world is actually quite positive and quite optimistic. And as an economist, I think that uh, I see lots of good things happening for the environment, for uh, you know, economic welfare, not just in the U.S., but, but across the world. And uh, as long as we use our resources efficiently, and that means both in a green sense, but also in a sense that we allocate our resources to their highest valued use okay. and so forth. And I also have some of the political concerns you have, but I am optimistic. Good. And, you know, I think optimism is an important thing. We really do. We need it. We need to, it's been a dismal, but, you know, we've got to look, we've got to face problems. We've got to look things head on, but, you know, optimism is a good thing. So thank you, Chris, for being with us. And um, we should yeah. look Well, I appreciate future. being invited. Farid, nice, nice to meet you. Enjoyed it. Dale, nice to meet you, too. Okay, closing statements. Do you have something that you'd like to say, Dale? Sure. In parting. 
Okay, well, first of all, I, I guess reiterate my opening comment of thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. a pleasure. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and to you know, represent financial services and most more specifically the credit union uh, side of that. Um, you know, I, I would say that, you know, again, for creating lasting prosperity um, going into the future, it's important that each of us, um, you know, have a savings strategy, have an investment strategy, have a, a consumption strategy, and, and along with that consumption would be, um, you know, how we're going to borrow money, why we're going to borrow money, and, and when it makes sense to, when it doesn't make sense to do that, and, and um, encourage people to, um, you know, use their uh, resources to their advantage, but also use them in a prudent way. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for the opportunity to have me here. Uh, as I said earlier, economics should serve the people. It is not only rich people, but every people. Unfortunately, not everybody knows economics very well. They are not a real business people, and they do not know how to do it. But we have to create a system that makes it possible for the people that they could have it. State Bank is one of those, and mm -hmm. Union is also getting there, mm -hmm. but it's not already, not well, there enough. So yeah. we have to, if you exploit people, 30% interest rate on your credit card, mm -hmm. uh, late fee charges, mm -hmm. and over... Uh, and that's really, that's uh, one of the bigger banks. In tolls, yeah. and this, and that, and everywhere you do, and the people's income doesn't rise at all. Actually, they lose. And then the, you look at the students with student yeah. loan debt. And, mm -hmm. and how do you want to exist as a rich guy, with, as an entrepreneur, as a right. businessman in this environment? It's impossible. It's just, it's not economic, it's mathematics. Yeah. And I, it's mathematics. I, yes. And you cannot last. So what we have to do? We have to get rid of minimum wage. For a short period of time, we should do it until we introduce living wage. living wage. Living wage, you should not look at it as a charity because we are doing already in terms of food stamps, in uh, Section 8 program, unemployment, and blah, blah, We're blah. We're already subsidizing And jails and so on and so forth. Yes. So we should look at this as a stimulus mm -hmm. that you give to these people that they go and spend and buy your stuff you're a rich guy, you're mm -hmm. an entrepreneur, you s want to sell all your products, that they be able to buy it. Mm -hmm. This is how they should be doing it. And it's not a matter, it's right to do it as a, from the moral standpoint, mm -hmm. but it has more economic sense to it. Yeah, so in the, economic in the big sense. picture it comes yeah. back. So, but, well, and that's, that's a great point. Um, living wage is a good thing, and I have to say, in my own experience, Back in the 80s, I used to manage a clothing store, and it was just a fun store. We had men and women's clothes. It was the disco days. And, all. and I have to say that I was making like $20,000, which was actually kind of good money for back then. But, you know, I, was, <laughs> I make more than that now, and I cannot save like I could then. I actually saved more money. I was able to save... Ten grand that I used to put in my children's and I to save now it's it's very hard and so to help the economy grow until we can invest in banks and invest in our future like at a, at a credit union it is better to have more people making more money than few people making all the money so I guess we'll end with that thanks thank you both for coming it was thank a you pleasure. Both. Thank you.